I, I read this passage of scripture and I'm telling you, I laid down and I couldn't sleep. I got up and I started walking the floor and I began to see things here that have a relationship to where we are. And uh, I, I want to spiritualize on this and yet, you know, I don't want to personalize it too much, but um, I just want to share some thoughts that uh, I, I'm excited about that I believe God wants to help us in our future. In the book of Haggai, in the book of Haggai, for you that have Thompson Chain Reference Bibles, it's on page 995. But in that first chapter, I just want to read a little statement as the prophet was speaking under the direction of the Lord. In verse 7, chapter 1, Haggai, verse 7, he said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Praise God. There's some more passage there that I'm going to point to here just a little bit later. But I want to talk to you for just a few minutes. Brother Paul Gray asked me about a title, and this is a little awkward, but I said the best way I can say it is Israel's Temple, the Pilgrim's Campground, and the Focus on Revival. Amen. And I think they go together for our people. Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord is concerned about the direction that we're going. He's concerned about where we are. He's also concerned about our spirit and our attitude. And I was reading last night, late in the night, about uh, uh, how that when the, when the Messiah would come, Isaiah said uh, of him that a bruised reed shall he, uh, that shall he not break and a smoking flax shall he not quench. His attitude, he's coming with the attitude of not taking pride or pleasure in just squelching people, but he's taking uh, it on his mission uh, to fan the flame, the flickering flame and weak flame though it may be, to fan the, fan the flame of fire and revival. I can see, when I read that little statement, I can see it, uh, my, my grandparents, they had... Uh, way back in the hills of Kentucky and living in an old log house and, um, and a long time didn't have electricity and I was intrigued by those lamps and the wicks and all those things and I've actually watched as one of them was running out of oil and the flame, it, it went down, you could turn the wick up but it didn't affect the flame because the oil supply was gone. And I, I studied that thing as a little boy, I watched and the flame burned lower and lower and I wanted to watch till it went out. And then finally it got to a point to where at one end it, it turned black, the flame, little bitty bit of light that was there. And it started retreating across the top of that wick and it was smoking uh, on the left hand side of that wick. But it came over to a place until there was just a tiny little bitty glow there. Now if you get oil to it in time, it would fan the flame of revival. It would revive itself and the light would, would flourish there. On that occasion, it went out and my grandmother put oil in it and relit it and in just a little bit from the depths and from the bottom, it pulled up that oil and uh, it, it, it created a flame that produced, uh, that produced light. And I believe what the Lord was saying here, what the smoking flax, he would not quench. He said, I'm not coming to blow your fire out. I'm not coming to just pinch that flame off. I may be interested in trimming the wick, but I'm interested in you having a stronger flame. And he would fan the flame of revival. And the reason that's significant in light of the temple, I believe that God put a lot of stock in the people gathering together in a place to worship God. Just stop and think back. I reviewed just briefly over in in 2 Chronicles chapters 5 and 6 when Solomon had completed the temple. And it was a, it was a beautiful thing when they, they began to move the uh, fixtures into the, that new temple and they were getting ready for the dedication. And the glory of God came in there, it said, in such a way that the priests could not stand to carry out their functions. The glory of the Lord was there. God's pleasure was being exhibited and manifested in as the, that they had sacrificially worked for years to bring about that which was God planned and God provided for. So it became the center of their moral and spiritual compass. And that day when all Israel, when they were ready to cut the ribbons and the people were invited from all segments of the nation 
to gather in. And Solomon began to pray. Oh, there's a, there's a statement there how that the glory of God came down. God's glory so thick. In fact, in some cases, the glory lingered on the countenances of the priests until the people had difficulty looking in their direction. Oh, the symbolism there that God would do it again. Amen. That, that we would go out of here, our camp meeting, as we begin to head back across the country and go back to our, our in some cases, little churches and look around our neighborhoods and ask God to help us to have a glowing face and a burning heart and a new vision uh, to build up that which he has given us, a place of responsibility uh, to, uh, to bring folks to meet Jesus and to watch God as he uh, helps and works with them. Right here this morning, I can see a number of faces where I can remember perhaps some looked upon them and said, you know, does that fellow even have a chance? I mean, does that little kid, what is there wrapped up in it? Maybe it's a bus child or maybe it's some little neighborhood kid that, that, that came to church. Maybe he came from a dysfunctional family, but somebody loved him and gave him some milk and cookies and attention and love and, and a good warm Sunday school class and, and then some attention outside the class, maybe visited in their home. And to this day, God has created a miracle story by turning them around. And their desire today is to be in the house of God, worshiping with the people of God. And God has given them families, children. And now they're repeating the process of bringing them into the presence of God. The temple was an important thing. It was the center of moral and spiritual uh, compass. In other words, as they came together in the presence of God, uh, your spiritual and moral compass is adjusted it ought to be adjusted. Praise God. We live in a wicked world. You that have secular jobs out there are bombard bombarded every day by the pictures hung up in the workplace, by the filthy conversation, by the suggestiveness, by the ungodliness that you walk in and, and, and live, you live around. But thank God to be able to well, come to church on Sunday morning and have your soul stirred and fed among God's people. To come to the house of God, to come to the, uh, to the camp meeting and, and listen to a, a message dug up out of God's word and the penalty, uh, 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 pendulum of truth uh, is dropped down in the midst of the tabernacle and, and you begin to see that truth and measure your life by that truth uh, and then are convinced it's not just a discipline in the Pilgrim Holiness Church or what something that a pastor or a preacher might have said, but as we align ourselves with the principles of God's word, we go out of here knowing that we have the support port of heaven as we represent truth. Praise God. That's why we're concerned about uh, the evangelists that we have and the truth that they preach and the standard that they represent. We want to continue by the grace of God to do that very thing because it is so vitally important. Praise the Lord. The temple uh, which contained the presence of God and many, many other things that would build character and so forth. But a trip to that uh, temple, it was a place where they affirmed uh, the holy principles. It was where the priests would meet with the most high God. In our dispensation this morning and in other services, I do thank God that that wall is broken down. I thank God that that, 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 that veil has been rent and we can approach the God of the mercy seat through the Son of God and make our petitions known to Him and have a direct relationship with Him. <laughs> Praise God. And you know, He comes to reaffirm, to affirm, and then to reaffirm holy principles that He's given us. Praise God for that. In other words, in this day, the most high God, He becomes the most nigh God. Hallelujah. Praise His wonderful name. In our day, it's to exalt Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. It's to expound the word of God. It's to expect the visitation of the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. And really what we become are keepers of the gate or overseers of this priceless treasure. We do have a responsibility. And all of us, the fanners of the flame, if you will, Praise the Lord. I tug it in the back of my mind. There's a, uh, something that perhaps I ought to share with you because it's come back to me again and again and it's right there right now. I remember so well back there in days when we were at Bible school and I thank God for some of you that we went to Bible school with that are here with us today. Praise God. Had no idea when uh, a little old 17-year-old boy would leave uh, Canaan land and uh, old Charlie... Charlotte are here. Charlie, we packed up that old Ford of his 
And uh, we'd both been accepted, you know, and we got to the Ohio River. I remember telling Charlie, is there some place you could pull off here so we could say goodbye to the United States? We're heading north. I uh, had no idea all of the, the lifelong effect that it would be involved in saying yes to God at an altar and minding God in the matter of the call to preach. Praise God. And you know, I can remember, oh, I, I, I did like most 17, 18 year olds, you know, I, I got to Frankfurt and I looked over the crop of nice looking young ladies that come from here and there. And I had my heart broke a time or two. I can remember one, you know, that I was serious about and, and uh, I, you know, you do dumb things. Daddy told me before I left home, you know, puppy love always leads to a dog's life. And I can remember of my broken heart as I was nursing my wounds and old Charlie, he, he was in the next room in the boys dorm and we had this little code, you know, if we needed to talk to each other, we had a certain knock, you know, and we got the signal out and, and I was over there uh, uh, grieving and crying and nursing my broken heart. And uh, there's a peck on the wall. And my buddy, very discerning, I really don't want to talk to nobody, but I, I answered the knock. He hollered through the wall, come on over. And I, I went over and he was, uh, he was helping me and supporting me with my broken heart. Praise God for good buddies, good friends. Amen. He was engaged to be married. And then he brought up a girl's name. You know, and he, he mentioned her, and I said, well, the last time I heard about her, she was dating three or four guys at Asbury College, and she wouldn't have any interest in me. And beside that, I'm through with these women anyway. I'm here to study for the ministry, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not interested. I'm going to keep my mind on my business. God called me to preach, and I'm not interested in the women. And you know, I, I left that room and went over, back over into my room, and I sat there, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I thought about that, and I nursed that resolution, and I was successful in keeping to that for about two hours. And I was thinking about what Charlie had said. He said, you know, sometime we go down there, maybe we could, we could double date. You could call Patsy and, and we could double date. And you know, it, that became interesting to me. So I wrote her a letter and uh, I sent it to Asbury College, Wilmore, Kentucky. And I found out later that she got it on February the 14th. Now, how many of you know what's February the 14th? Valentine's Day. Boy, if I'd have known she got it, I would have been impressed. And she was so impressed that she wrote me back. And it was postmarked, that return letter was postmarked May the 11th. Well, she put it in her desk and it got under some stuff. And when she was cleaning out her desk to go home for the summer, <laughs> boy, I impressed her. Well, I remember going to that post office there at the campus for about 10 days, and I looked every day, but I never got nothing from Wilmore, Kentucky. And so finally I said, well, no love lost. I'm, I'm studying for the ministry. I'm done with women. But the time came when I got that letter. Brother R.K. Story was our dean. And I can see it to this day in the dining hall. He was passing out mail and everybody was looking in between bites, you know. And then he looked at me from across the dining hall and he smelled the letter. Jim Sutherland, wow. Mm. Well, everybody was interested in my mail. And I thought, I looked at that letter and I couldn't believe it. I don't think I even finished my meal. I got funny down here. And I got up and went to my room and I locked the door. Even Charlie couldn't interrupt this. And I read that letter, say, it wasn't bad. So I wrote her back. And she wrote back, and I wrote her back. And then I asked her for a date. I'm coming home for the summer. And she wrote me back and said no. Well, I didn't realize the problems that she was having, but I said, I'm not dumb. I'm going to try this one more time. And uh, if I get a cold shoulder again, I'm not wasting my time, my gas, or going to the trouble. Well, the next time, everything was just hunky-dory. I still remember that to this day. We visited the old Pilgrim Holiness campground, had a double date with Charlie and Charlotte, had a good time. And that was the beginning. Man, I was head over heels. I was lost. 
But I tried not to put on like that. And, but you know, the time came as it got more serious and more serious, and I felt in my heart when I prayed that she was the one. And um, she was going to a place where they had a different standard than we had. Now, she came from the same background that I came from, but I, there was a noticeable difference and an effect that where she was going had on her. And it does affect, and it will affect you, friend. It will. I mean, there were people that, that actually had no standards or wore jewelry and that kind of stuff that would put some of us to shame when it comes to reading the Bible and, and having devotions. Pray for hours, pray in the night. I mean, uh, and, and tremendous uh, biblical scholars and some of those things. And that has an influence. And you get soaked up in that and it'll influence you. I don't care how tough you are. And I can remember how that we would have some of those discussions and I would talk about standards. I began to think about looking at her and putting her in a parsonage beside me. I began to think about, uh, you know, taking her to revival meetings and having her as a part of our ministry. And so we began to talk seriously about standards of separation. I'll never forget, that, even on the very first date, she got to fiddling with her bangs. And I was shocked to find out, I mean, she had them cut off way up here. And I can still see it. We were, well, I can still see it. And uh, I said, you know, there's some things that, that I've already settled in my heart that I, I preach against. And I'm going to stand against some of this stuff. I feel like it's biblical and scriptural. And I'm not going, and I really do like you, but uh, I don't expect to be dating a woman that cuts her hair. And boy, I can see her. She sat up and she looked around at me and she said, who cuts their hair? Well, I said, you do. She said, I do not. And I took my fingernail and made a red mark. I said, what is that? Well, that's not my hair. That's my bangs. Wow. I got a new revelation. And then she proceeded to say, well, let me tell you something. You're not going to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's right. That's right. Man, you are 18 years old. You are an adult. And I'm going to tell you what to do? No way. I'm not even going to try. But I want to tell you this one thing. If you ever put your scissors in that hair again, I can promise you this. I won't be back. Oh, are you all still with me? Uh, you know, you say, well, Brother Southern, is that that serious? In principle, it was. Absolutely. And then it was one thing after another that we just kind of, and I can remember taking her back to Wilmore, and, and I can remember we would pray before I'd let her out of the car, and we would bawl and cry, and I would say, Lord, would you please show this woman some things? And I heard her crying and praying and said, Lord, would you please show me? I thought, all you gotta do is listen. And we would do that. We'd have wonderful, wonderful times and go to church together, sing together. And she would support me in my preaching, but we'd get to talking about these serious issues, you know, as I took her back from, from, from the date and delivered her, you know, at the, at the college. And boy, we would cry and pray and, and about these things because I knew they were serious. And I want to tell you something. You know, I'm just losing my message, aren't I? But this is important. And I remember the time came when I got tired of the fight. I got tired of the pressure. And I got tired of it. It was, you know, I was holding down a job, working my way through school, trying, had four hours I could sleep a night and then work a full, um, I think 48 hours a week and then try to study. And uh, I'd save up for, for money from a gasoline, take my old 56 Chevy and go down to Kentucky and have a date once a month. Had it all measured out, my little budget, you know, and I was running on fumes and I got tired. And one day I sat down in my room and I said, you know, uh, I'm tired of this. Maybe, maybe, maybe I have been just a little too old-fashioned. Maybe I have been just a little too radical. I remember being called in by the dean of, of students, and the compromise was in the wind. 
And he called me, I had a revival. And, and, and in that revival meeting, there were some of those, uh, uh, there was uh, five boxes of jewelry left on this side of the altar. I mean, of people that prayed through and got help from God. People were stripping for the race and God was giving people conviction. It got back down to the school and he called me in, you know, and, uh, and said something like, I'd like to know, but what authority you have to preach against jewelry? I couldn't believe it. Well, what are these people doing talking about wearing sleeves? Where do you get this stuff? I mean, just one thing. Boy, he, he had a pretty good ear honed in on my revivals 100 miles away. Somebody reported to him. And you know, I remember I said something like this. I said, you know, I love you, brother. And I do respect you and I appreciate you. I would think that you ought to be calling students in here and just tell them what, that they ought to, you ought to kind of buck them up and you ought to say, you need to take your stand. You need to hold to the old paths. You need to keep to these principles. And here you are calling me into question, but I want to tell you, sir, and I wasn't smarter and, and I loved that man till the day he died. And I still love him. I appreciate what he invested in me. But I can remember as, as God prompted my heart, I said, if you're trying to say in a subtle way that I need to, you know, to just become a little more liberal, if that's what you're saying, you got to me too late. We got a problem. Because God's already told me some things that I'm supposed to do, and I, that measures way above the opinions of any man. But I was telling you about how that I was in that room, and, 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 and I got to, you know, I'm just tired. And I, and I, I just said, well, maybe I've been just a little too radical, too straight, this kind of thing. I didn't think anything about it. But over the next, I was preaching somewhere every week. And over the course of that next month, the door slammed shut. I didn't even think about it at first. I know one thing I couldn't pray through. And then I wrecked my car. I mean, hit a guy, slammed, brushed down the side of his car. There's a post, a telephone pole in the ditch and a stone fence over here and a guy with no tail lights stopped dead in the road in front of me on a wet, rainy road. Cars coming head on, no place to go. I slid sideways and hit a fella. Took a wrecker and dragged that old 56 Chevy in. And I went out to that old tobacco barn where I prayed a lot. And I said, God, I want to know what's going on here. What is going on? The door's closed. I can't pray. I've had this wreck. Everything I'm doing has gone in reverse. Would you please tell me? Now listen, the Lord will tell you. He'll show you. And as sure as I see your faces, all of a sudden he took me back to that dormitory room when I questioned God and the convictions that God had given me. And you know, it's one thing to glibly say something. It's another thing to have the Lord to take you to the place and have you look in on yourself. And then the Lord say, hear this? And I heard myself say that. Not only was I horrified by what I heard myself say, I was horrified by God's attitude about it. And I said, oh Lord. And I repented. I asked God to forgive me. But also at the same time said, I love that girl with all my heart. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm done arguing standards with her. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this crowd. And if she's not going that way, she's going to have to find somebody else to go another way. I am. I, I've settled it in my heart. And I can remember I went back down to pick her up. We were going over to Frankfort, Indiana. And on the way, I, I was in the edge of Frankfort from Asbury. And I said, uh, there's something I have to say. And I began to tell her what had happened up to this point. And I said, I have brought into question things that I've been preaching and have questioned God and the Lord rebuked me. And I want you to know that I have made up my mind that this is the way it's gonna be. If you're gonna take a different course, I do love you, but I am releasing you. You can go your way if you're not interested in taking this way and standing beside me in these principles that I feel are very serious and precious to my heart. When I said that, the glory of God came down in that car. She'll bear witness with that. We were both so crying, praising God. I mean, right there on 421 in Frankfort, Kentucky. And, I, and she began to cry and then she scooted over real close to me. I remember it. And she said, well, I'm going to be faithful also. I'm going to, this is the way I want to go too. Some things I don't understand, but I'm certainly not going to fight you on it. Praise God. We had a little spell right there. I might even beat the steering wheel and blow the horn a little bit. 
Praise God. We pulled into the driveway of the Pilgrim Holiness Church in Frankfort, Kentucky. And the girl, she was with a trio that were going to be singing in that youth service. Four weeks, five weeks. I hadn't been asked to preach one time. And it's probably a good thing, as dead and empty as I was. But the pastor met me at the door and said, Jim, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but could you preach tonight? I said, wow. And I looked at Patsy. I said, huh, look at that. Yeah. And I had the help of God. Praise the Lord. And God's glory. Can, that might not mean a thing to you. But I want to tell you, over these years, that was when we were engaged and before we were married. But over these years, I've gone back many, many times to that place. And I don't want to violate that sacred trust that God gave me at that time. Praise God forever. And I want to tell you, that's what camp meeting's about. That's, what can, that's why, again, we have the evangelists uh, that we do and the emphasis that we do. And God, we need to repeat those things over and over and over again. Amen. I'm not interested in turning a, a real radical turn to the right or a turn to the left. God's instruction to me is to go right down the center of the road and to keep the atmosphere spiritual, to mind God, to emphasize the truth, and to continue to drop that plumb line of God's word. Praise God. Look at the circumstance of these people. They were unclear uh, in their concept of time because the first question they asked, he said, the people say, the time has not come. The time has not come. Some of them had come back from captivity and now here they were spending time on their houses. He said, you have sealed your houses, which the word seal there means like wainscoting. In other words, they were spending their resources, making their houses real pretty. Not just the basics, but they were spending money in decorating and interior decorating. And in its place, there's nothing wrong with that. But while they were doing that, they were letting the temple just fall into ruins. And what God was doing is saying, he said, you say it's not time. I mean, they were weary. They were taking pride in their own affairs and in their own home. But at the same time, while the enemy was keeping them overly busy there, the focus of attention was away from the sp place of, of the spiritual spring well the place where God uh, taught them uh, to come together in the house of God. So they were unclear uh, in their concept of time. I looked over in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and I found there, you know, when Saul had uh, been defeated and, and the country was in disarray and here was David who had been anointed king way back uh, there, had been hiding for his own life and, and now out of all this confusion and political chaos, all of a sudden God began to put it in the hearts of good thinking men. And there were some good women that stood by them, but they were warring men. They were wise men. They had an understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. And with that revelation, God brought them together to pool their resources and to come together. And eventually the nation was restored and the temple was restored and worship was restored. Now here these people, they had lost their concept of time. <coughs> Pardon me, they had an unbalanced sense of priorities. Your house or my house, God was saying. What's your emphasis going to be? <clears throat> they had an unclear view of the path that they were on because God said two or three times, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Stop and think about where you're going, the direction you're going. <clears throat> and as a result, uh, in fact, to get their attention, just like the illustration I just gave you, a personal illustration, the heavens were sealed and the ground became barren. Frowning providences were used of God to gain their attention and to reinforce the seriousness with which God saw them neglecting the temple and even temple worship. And then there was the, the place of obedience. In verse 6, uh, it says that you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, and you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to, be, or to put them in a bag with holes in them. That's what happens when people don't tithe their money. I've seen it over and over again. When they withhold from God, it's like the rest of your money, you put it in a bag and it gets away. It gets away. God will extract those funds that belong to him. You will not prosper if you cheat God. Over in verse 11, I believe it is. He said, I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon the labor of the hands. God used frowning providences to get their attention so that they would ask the question, hey, what's wrong here? 
I remember when God answered prayer instantly. I remember praying in the night. I remember my crops. I remember my fields. I remember my herd. I remembered my vineyards. But now all of a sudden we're spinning our wheels. And so what was God saying? He was saying, give me mine. Give me my attention. I want your attention on something spiritual and doing something extraordinary for God. I thank God for whatever he has to do uh, to uh, get our attention and to remind us of our circumstance. There's the circumstance of the people. There's the command of God. Consider your ways. Theirs was a way of self-interest, a way of ease and of comfort. It was a command of divine origin. He said, here was God saying to the people through Haggai, go up to the mountain, bring wood and build. Praise God. Oh, up. You're making progress when you're minding God. Go up to the mountain. There's work involved. There's some blood and sweat and tears involved, but go up to the mountain. And anybody that brings wood know that it just doesn't happen to fall on your little wagon so you can roll it down the hill. I mean, even with a chainsaw, it doesn't take one lick till the sweat's a pouring. There's work involved. There's hand labor involved. There's purposeful energy involved. Then he said, I want you to build. And then I want you to notice that God spake by voice, but he used human instruments to bring it to pass. There's the circumstance of the people, the command of God. Then there's the challenge of the task, the enormity of the task. It was no small thing. It was a big job. But you look at that foundation that's poured and you start down there with the basics and I'm finding out long before that, you know, a lot of times Kentucky and West Virginia and some of those places, they found a place to, to build and they'd dig a hole and, and uh, kind of sight it, you know, didn't know what a transit was. Pull a string, draw some lines and say, we want it to go from here to here. But I'll tell you one thing, in this day, building in the city limits of a major city, you don't do that. You've got to talk to engineers. I thought that was somebody that run a train. But I find out that's a different whistle, brother. And it's expensive, but it has to be done. And I understand the principle and the reason for it. But there's the drawings, there's all the planning, all those things. And your structure is only going to last and be as good as the plans you put in it before you turn the first shovel of dirt. And, 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 and I want to see something that's going to last when I'm long gone, if I'd live to be 85 years old. Uh, you look at that crowd of young children that were up here today. Man, it wound up in my heart. I said, that's what I have in mind for our camp future. We're, we're building to have a sanctuary against the world but, but have the right kind of spiritual diet and the right kind of preaching and the right kind of examples. Praise God. Somewhere down the line when the Victory Trio, another 30 years are in rocking chairs and thinking about Pilgrim Camp, God will raise up some more. Amen. And there will be more children and there will be your children's children. I believe God has that in mind. I do. I really do with all my heart. But he spake, God, the command of God. And then there's the challenge, the enormity of the task. And then there's the need for committed laborers. Folks, we live in a day when people don't like to be committed to anything. You talk to them about membership sometimes, and you can find out what their commitment is. Well, I'm not sure, you know. I mean, maybe on vacation we might want to put on a pair of shorts. That's right, Lord, help us. Oh, and some of them people never say that. But they're not sure they want to just take, you know, as this narrow way. And then those that are, when it comes right down to commitment, where is the commitment? There's some people you can't get to show up to a board meeting. You can't get your people every night to a revival. I mean, where's our commitment? Thank God for some of those precious people that were there when they didn't feel like it and kept the home fires burning and the bills paid. I think about those two ladies down at Fountain Square Pilgrim Holiness Church that are presented to the conference. Amen. Uh, Ethel and, and the Sexton, uh, those girls. I met them 35 years ago in revival meetings, and they made a commitment. And I went down, be honest with you, I got discouraged. I don't do that but once or twice in 30 years. Uh, but I don't like even the talk of discouragement. But boy, oh boy, here's uh, things in disarray and very little money. And finally, I just had it in my, in my mind. I said, well, you know, if you can't keep things going and, and, and keep the bills paid, well, we'll just close the doors and sell this thing. But I got down there and went inside that place and I saw the sum that were there and then measured uh, the fortitude and the strength and the passion 
of these two girls that have paid the price and struggled and they wept and said, our family's not saved and we can't close this thing, Brother Sutherland. There was a commitment, a real commitment, and they've shown it by their actions and their attitudes. And God's going to answer their prayers one of these days. Praise God. Where is the preacher and his wife that's going to take that responsibility? Hallelujah. Oh, we need, there's the need for committed laborers. laborers and, and I want to take a public uh, opportunity uh, to thank God for the counsel that we have. And I know we have others that are worthy to walk in those shoes, but we've got some of the finest individuals that operate in our council that anybody could ever want to work with. They have a passionate desire to see God move forward and God's blessings upon our people. And they are, they are men and men that are keepers of the gate and overseers of the treasure. I can assure you that. And it's been a privilege and a blessing to work with them. And I thank God for it. I thank God for those that have given up time to help us with our financial advice concerning the uh, development for our campground and those that have given their wisdom and counsel. I wish every you, one of you could have just sat in on some of those meetings where the council and the strategic development committee and our financial uh, uh, people have sat together and worked over plans and worked for, for hours just praying and trying to discern what God would have us to do. Some of the best minds and hearts and men that we have and then to go out of there feeling like, you know, we touch God today. We've got direction from God. And it's an honor and a privilege to have men that are committed to help, help guide this, uh, the, the ship forward. There's the need for joyful redirection of personal assets to the task. Did you hear that? That's quite a little mouthful. But there is the need for joyful redirection of personal assets to the task. Praise God. I've had people this last week that have come and gone from here that some of them will never bring children here. Some of them don't even have any children. But I know they have a passion and love for God and they're so far away. Uh, but here's $1,000 because I believe in what's happening right there in that camp. Praise God. Here's another one that says, you know, I'm interested. I've come back to my roots and, and here's $1,000 for the camp. I want to see it go forward. Praise God. And I have a feeling he's going to bring some other people next year if Jesus tarries. Hallelujah. We need some commitment and joyful redirection of personal assets. You know, we can do a lot more than we think we can if we really get our heart into it. Praise God. I remember um, I, I actually broke an old serpentine belt on that old Buick. I was running up Interstate 69. And uh, man, I felt terrible while I was up pulling that thing down the edge of the interstate and, and pulling it into the rest area so I could get some trucker to tell me how to work on it. And then when I got it started, the motor was testifying to a sound that I don't like. It was the main bearings. Wow. And uh, I told, uh, finally, I, I drove it, and I don't like the sound, and I knew someday it was going to lay down on the road. But I went down, and, and I just happened to see Brother Dodrell. And I said, I want you to listen to this. And he went up and raised the hood and put his thumb down on that motor and looked at me and shook his head. And uh, he said, you can drive it a little bit, but it's going to die. Those are main bearings. And I said, well, the last thing in the world I need is try to buy a car. But I was talking to a man that was interested in selling me a car. <laughs> he said... He said, hey, you just take this one that I've got here. He said, the book price on it's only $12,000. I said, <coughs> you've got to be kidding me. I'm not interested. I can't do it. Well, now let me finish my sentence. And then when he told me, he said, I'll sell it to you for exactly what I got in it. And it was just a little better than half that. Woo. All of a sudden, I began to think about it in terms of, you know, I think I can do that. I think it can be done. And within just a matter of hours, I was driving that old green Buick. Praise the Lord. We can do a lot of things if we really put our heart to do it. If our heart's in it, we can do it. Praise God. But what was the consequence? The consequence of spiritual obedience. Listen, he said, I will take pleasure in it. God, how does God manifest himself to take pleasure in something? One is the provision for wholesome fellowship. Praise the Lord. You know what? I, one thing I enjoy from camp meeting you know that round table over there that's about 30 feet from that coffee place over there? Thank you. 
you know when the fishermen come to tell their stories and they gather around that table during the course of the year oh brother Howard Clark and if he's here I'd, I'd still say this you know he said he had a carpal tunnel problem and he said when you see brother Leach you tell him it's from catching them big fish and I told brother Leach and he said when you see him you tell him it's from wrestling around with all that bunch of little old brim about that long Amen. I love good Christian fellowship. I said this, is this the spit and whittle club over here? <laughs> but the blessedness of fellowship, praise God. And then to, to gather in an early morning prayer meeting and to carry the load together and to pray together and then to see uh, God bring folks to the, to the camp meeting and, and you see one pray through and another pray through and you come back this year and you see they've kept the victory over the year and they brought somebody with them. Praise God. And you go to the youth camp. And I told my wife, I said, honey, who in the world are all these youngins? Some of them I don't even know. And it's, I'm embarrassed to find out that it's some preacher's kid or grandkid. And last time I saw them, they were about four days old. <laughs> they were just little bitty things. But they grow up. I remember at youth camp the other day, old Jeremy Fish pulled up there in his truck and he said, Brother Southern, look over yonder. And I looked over yonder and I said, Okay, what am I looking at? He said, that's my boy over there. It was just last year. He said, I was one of them over there. It seemed like just last year. But time has transpired. This is the first year he's old enough to be involved over there. And I'll tell you, when Brother Beecher preached his message and asked for folks that wanted to make a commitment for God, to do something for God, I was praying and here was that fine group across here. And I opened my eyes and there was the same little old 13-year-old kid right there in front of me. I put my hand on his head and I prayed that God would use him. Praise God, that's what camp meeting is about. It's a transferring of a godly heritage from one generation to another generation. I'll tell you what I'm tired of is wrestling with a camp meeting date and wondering if we are going to have the, the place that we can rent. All you've got to do is get crossways with, with somebody and you'll be sent packing because you don't own anything. But I believe God wants to remedy that. I believe he's in, in the process of remedying that. Praise God. Uh, there's a good feeling down the road in Anderson when we've gone down through there. I will, I will take pleasure in it. God manifests his pleasure through wholesome fellowship, uh, through saturating glory. When God is pleased, the glory of God comes. Hallelujah. And we've seen some, but I'd love to see that real breaking through till everything is shattered and people are weeping their way through to God. Amen. And being sanctified holy and being challenged by the Holy Ghost to go out and do something for God. Hallelujah. I wish we had a group of, of fired up, filled up young people that we could just send on the road to, to some of two or three or four of these little dying churches and come in there for a week or six weeks at a time and pray the glory down and fill that place up and give them a spiritual charge. Hallelujah. And then God said that he would bless their offerings. He said, I will take pleasure in them. I'll bless your offering. He said, try me and see, saith the Lord. Bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse and I'll pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. Jim Sutherland didn't say that. Brother Gray didn't say that. God said that. And there is a principle that is alive and well in 2005. Amen. If we mind God and we give sacrificially, God will bring it back to you. And, and then sanctify the place in edification. I like to come to a place where my soul is edified. Man, I tell you, there's devils and demons out yonder, but it's a wonderful thing to come to camp in a gathering of God's people and feel your heart energized and go away from here breathing praises to Almighty God. We've been edified. Who in the world likes to go into a local church and whatever's been going on there in the shadows or in public like to come out there dragging their, their problems with you home? Isn't that horrible? But I tell you, I like to go to a place where there's edification. I've been in places where as soon as the amen was said, people started hitting the exits and heading for the parking lot. I had one young pastor say one time, he said, boy, Brother Southern, I don't, these people, you know, you could preach another message. They stand around for 45 minutes talking. And I said, you better thank God for that, my friend. When they start hitting the exits, that's when you need to get worried. Thank God. You go out there and there's all that ungodliness out there in the world. And the only time, a lot of times that we see one another and see people of like faith 
is in the house of God or some time of fellowship. Amen. When, when God is taking pleasure in his people, you just kind of like to subconsciously linger in the presence of God, in that atmosphere. And then another uh, consequence or the way God manifests his pleasure is peace among the brethren. I like peace. I praise God for peace. Joy unspeakable and full of glory and the peace of God. And then there's full hearts and marital relationships. When God blesses his people, when God blesses our couples, and the advice that was given during that children's service that Sister William shared, I, I say amen. It's a wonderful thing to take your family home and those little kids in the back seat, they look up and see mommy and dad in love. Did you hear me? I know I'm getting mushy, but some of you old geezers know what I'm talking about. Praise God. A manifestation of love. There's just a real good feeling that goes in the heart of the child. Coming home from a spiritual meeting and knowing that mom and dad's in love with each other and that they love them. When God takes pleasure in his people, he gives them full hearts and marital relationships. And then he multiplies families with the gift of children. Thank God for our children. These treasures we saw this morning. And then he renews our vision. He fires our passion. He recruits our laborers. He energizes the harvesters. Divine encouragement. Look, in chapter 2 and verse 4, I want you to look at this. He said, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people, saith the Lord, and work. Work. For I am with you, saith the Lord. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. Well, hallelujah. And then I can hear somebody say, well, who's going to pay for it? And it was like the Lord knew that that's what some of those old Hebrews were going to say. And down there in verse 8, it doesn't even seem to fit in. But down there in verse 8, he said, I'll shake the nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And by the way, we're going to hear more about China. Praise God. And we have some precious uh, Ch Chilean people here. And they were talking about, oh, can't you send somebody down to Chile? And we were talking about Peru. We've got an invitation. Some of the old pilgrims down there have sent word up. They'd like for the pilgrims here just to stand by them and help them. And I'd like to send the Rundells back down there again. They did a good work. Praise God. I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord. And then he said, the silver is mine. He may loan you a few hundred dollars and you may have it in your billfold this morning. I hope it don't stay there long. But the, you know who it belongs to? The silver is mine and the gold is mine saith the Lord of hosts, and the glory of this latter house greater than the former, and this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Praise God. You know, we're going to close this service this morning. I'd like for us to simply bow our heads for just a moment. And uh, we're going to close with, a, with an offering and with a commitment. We'll give you an opportunity just to take a few minutes here. We didn't take the offering a while ago on purpose. But I do believe in the providence of God that the Lord has these last 13 months has opened up for us where we're supposed to be in the direction that we should be headed. And uh, I know there's been a hindrance or two, but God wants to use an object that stood in the way to make us even a greater blessing. We've made an offer on that piece of property, and we will be hearing from those people sometime this next week probably. Um, we were talking about the need for at least... a hundred and seventy thousand dollars and um, we have uh, received word that there's some that have um, um, interest-free loans that they're going to put in our hands for two years there's some other offerings I'm gonna in fact I received one uh, last night and they told me don't open this until you're in front of the crowd and you're taking your offering so I'm kind of looking forward to what's in this envelope it feels real warm I hope it's not atomic but um, anyway, I have another envelope that's very special. But uh, let's give as unto the Lord. If uh, you, you have money that you would like to, for us to use to help secure this ground, 
for maybe a year or two. Uh, we don't want you to lose anything in it if you can't give it, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll match the interest that you're giving. You can put your money in the Lord's work. We not only have good credit, we have some very good equity and some valuable land that is paid for. And I want you to give that some thought, but it's here in the next probably 30, 35 days. Um, you remember the challenge we got in old Mockingbird Hill Park? I had 90 days to come up with $176,235. And uh, when I walked in the bank down there, some of you may not remember that story, but I walked in the bank and he said, what assets do you have? And I said, well, we got two file cabinets and two electric typewriters. And that was it. He just looked at him and said, well, Reverend, I, <laughs> I knew I was in the wrong bank. But it was Carl Erskine that heard our story and loaned us 119000 And um, on the 89th day, we wrote a check to Mr. Moody for $176,235. Mr. Erskine, the president of that bank, he looked at my document and he said, well, Reverend, do you know that if you don't come up with this money, you're going to lose this $5,000 on here? Well, I said, I guess I know that. I said, we're not going to lose that money. We're just looking for people that are worthy of the interest we're going to pay. Are you going to join us or not? I don't have time to waste if you're not. I'll find the people that, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, and I can still see him. He called his vice president up, and he was one of them pipe-smoking guys that's hired to give you a tough time borrowing money. And he read the document and said, Reverend, do you realize you're going to lose $5,000 here? I said, uh, I know, but we're not going to lose it. I said, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told him. In fact, I said, Carl, if you've got anybody else you want to hear this story, get him up here because I don't want to tell it anymore. And he got, he got some people there, and I told him our story. And I got excited about it. And the old pipe-smoking vice president said, No, we can't do this. And Carl Erskine looked at him and said, Bill, oh, that's enough. He said, Jim, he stood up, and he put out his hand and said, You can count on me for $119,000. And his VP like to swallowed his pipe. And he looked at him. And he looked at me. I said, now, Carl, is that your word? Can I count on that? Because I don't have time to waste, man. The clock's a ticking. He said, you can count on that. I promise you. And he kept his word. Praise God. And that's, that's how, with your money, too. We had some others that gave money. Uh, we were able to secure that land.